Welcome to the NIOSH Director's Webinar Series. This series examines topics related to working hours, sleep, and fatigue. Today our webinar focuses on managing fatigue in safety-critical workforces, primary risk factors, and practical approaches. I'm Dr. Imelda Wong, and along with Dr. Naomi Swanson, it is our pleasure to serve as moderators for today's webinar. On behalf of the NIOSH Working Hours and Fatigue Work Group, we are pleased to have you join us today with our featured speaker, Dr. Adam Fletcher, who is joining us from Australia in very early morning hours. Adam is recognized internationally as a pioneer in the measurement and management of workforce fatigue. He has worked as a research scientist at the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research in Washington, D.C., as well as at the University of Adelaide and the University of South Australia. Since founding Integrated Safety Support in 2006, he has been focused on developing, implementing, and reviewing fatigue-related safety programs with an emphasis on risk-based systems. He is an advisor to numerous government and industrial organizations globally. For more information about this presentation, please visit the NIOSH Work Schedules webpage. Thank you for your participation today, and I'll turn it over to our featured presenter, Dr. Fletcher. Thank you, Imelda. And uh, yes, good morning, and good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, depending on where you are in the world, I can actually see uh, in the participants list some names that I'm familiar with, and I can, can see that we have actually got quite good coverage from Asia through Eastern Europe into Europe and the US and Canada. So yeah, it's, a, it's an honor to be presenting today and I'm grateful for the invitation and I uh, look forward to spending the next hour giving my presentation and then working through questions and discussion at the end. So I really wanted to start today just really by acknowledging that this is a presentation that's open to the general public as well as, obviously, scientists and researchers and, and medical doctors and other people. So I've intentionally designed it so that ideally everyone, regardless of your level of uh, familiarity with this topic, um, will hopefully follow all of the detail but also get some depth for your level of interest. Uh, obviously, if you've got questions to, to really probe into more detail, you're, you're able to ask those through the session. And I'll make sure that we have, you know, likely at least 20 minutes, 15 to 20 minutes at the end for open discussion. So please do uh, send in those questions and we'll work through those at the end of the presentation. So I just want to give you a really brief overview of my company, Integrated Safety Support, because many of you have heard of us, but many of you may not. Um, we're actually headquartered in Australia, uh, but our team is, is really quite active globally. Uh, we tend to complete around about uh, projects in around about 10 countries per year uh, and do do a lot of work in uh, Europe, Asia Pacific, uh, as well as Canada and the US. So, so it's a broad interest from a small base in Australia um, and it really shows that the idea of managing shift work and fatigue and 24-hour workers in general is, is a relatively um, small focus in some ways, which is why there's interest uh, for people to, to draw us from different parts of the world. Um, I won't talk too much about uh, the team, but you can certainly look us up on our website. But we do have a really diverse, small team covering things from data analytics, sleep disorders, um, workplace research, safety regulation, change management, uh, and risk engineering. But as I said, you can certainly visit us on our website or any of our social media channels, which are at the bottom of the slides, if you'd like to learn more about that. Um, also, just before we jump into the content, uh, people often ask us how the science of managing fatigue and sleep and, and shift work translates into practical solutions. I just really wanted to, to very briefly uh, let you know that the kinds of things that we generally do uh, with, with clients and, and government is really things like fatigue-related training courses online or in classrooms, analyses of rosters with biomathematical models to actually understand where there might be hot spots of fatigue in certain hours of work, be that planned hours of work or actual hours of work. Um, we also do fatigue risk assessments, usually in the workplace, to actually identify 
risks and, and risk controls. Um, we do data analytics to actually integrate and understand statistical relationships between hours of work data, accident and incident data, um, could be absenteeism data or other costs related to human resources um, and, and those sorts of things. And then we also do sleep and fatigue studies, really measuring uh, sleep in the workplace, looking at how hours of work from rosters interact with sleep patterns and performance patterns and things like that. We'll talk briefly about solutions as I progress through, um, but for those of you relatively new for this to topic, I really just wanted to start with something very practical just so you understand um, where these sorts of uh, areas of science can actually move towards solutions uh, as well. Okay, so just briefly I wanted to give you the overview of the session. Uh, we are going to talk about what fatigue is, particularly in a 24-hour workplace context, and also talk about the effects of fatigue uh, on humans as, as individuals, but also in the workplace uh, as team. Uh, I'm going to give a very brief history of, of fatigue research and um, where the research of fatigue has started and, and progressed to. Uh, I'll then focus on some of the key primary risk factors so that you can really uh, understand the, the key variables or key factors that really feed into human performance in, in this fatigue management context. Uh, we'll then talk about the fatigue management uh, risk fatigue risk management approach uh, as a systematic safety management approach, uh, then look at some practical examples and then get into questions and discussion. So uh, let's get into it. Okay, so initially I just really wanted to start with a, a definition of really what we're talking about as fatigue in this industry or work context. Um, I thought this was important because fatigue is, is obviously a word that's often also used in, in other contexts. Um, in engineering, fatigue can be something talked about in terms of metal or material failure. Uh, in medicine, fatigue can be talked about in terms of the lethargy and tiredness and um, you know, impact that can be had you know, with people who are suffering certain medical conditions or are on certain um, medications or are really just recovering from certain treatments like chemotherapy. And what we're talking about today is, is a different fatigue. So what we're talking about is really, uh, as it says there, fatigue as a state of impairment that can negatively impact on safety, productivity, quality, morale, compliance and more uh, in the workplace uh, and in the, in the work context. Um, as a safety professional, I'm, I'm very interested in fatigue as this concept of a state of impairment because obviously when we're very well rested and very alert and very mentally engaged, um, we can yeah, really be more um, active and even proactive in our environments. And that can be both in our mind in terms of mental or cognitive capacity, but also in our physical body and our physical action. So from a safety and performance point of view, it's really this fatigue as a suboptimal state of impairment that we tend to be fairly focused on and fairly interested in. And that's really where I wanted to contextualise or focus up in terms of what we're talking about for this session. Um, in terms of what causes fatigue, um, I really just wanted to point out that it, fatigue occurs naturally in all of us as humans. And, and the kinds of factors, and we'll talk more about this as we progress, but the kinds of factors that that mainly lead into fatigue being higher are things like poor sleep quality, poor sleep quantity, um, workload, um, and as you can see there, that can, can actually be that workload's too low and my mental stimulation is actually you know, too little and I get bored and sleepy doing what I'm doing, uh, or it could be too high and overwhelming in a very high tempo, high demanding environment, and both of those factors of underload and overload are quite major factors uh, in a lot of workplaces. Um, we can have you know, very um, you know, underload tasks such as driving a long distance on a, on a long highway or perhaps monitoring uh, a patient's medical um, setup in a hospital 
uh, or watching a control panel operation in an oil and gas facility or an air traffic control uh, operation. Uh, and then obviously you can also have that overload factor where there's a lot going on, a lot of decisions to be made, you know, constraints on time, pressures to push work along and things like that. Uh, and then also there's a, there's a lot of personal factors. So this, in addition to sleep, it can be things like nutrition and hydration and and you know, there certainly sometimes are those individual, you know, personal and, and medical factors that can play into fatigue as well. And it's really important to appreciate that fatigue is often a protective mechanism. Uh, I think often fatigue can be seen as this bad thing, fatigue can be seen as a negative thing, something we should have less of and, and really try and eliminate. But actually Humans aren't programmed to be alert and, and active 24 hours a day. You know, we're generally, we are designed and programmed to be more alert and more active in the daytime hours. And it's perfectly dark in the very early morning where I am, so I'm certainly not at my peak of performance, um, you know, by programming at this time of day or night. Uh, and obviously, yeah, in the nighttime we're designed to be asleep and, and recovering and, and preparing as well. So it's important to, to really not see fatigue just as this broadly negative thing because it can be a very protective mechanism. Uh, it can tell us that we really need to rest and recover. And it does make sense from this evolutionary point of view since fatigue can really uh, impact on risk taking and safety and, and our health. So if we're getting these signals from our brain that we're tired and we need to stop, uh, or we're getting these signals from our body that we're yeah, physically you know, needing rest, um, that can actually be a really good thing, a really positive thing. Now, of course, in the workplace, we don't always get to stop. We don't always get to rest. And so in that sense, fatigue that operates in the workplace is really something that is inevitable but needs to be managed. Uh, it will never be eliminated, but it does need to be managed. And yeah, as I've already said, depending on the source of the fatigue, we might need sleep, rest, food, minerals, vitamins, hydration, and a whole range of things. But um, as I said, it, it's something that is protective and, and valuable from the correct context. Uh, I won't spend too long on this, but um, this is a, a spectrum that we design to use in, in a lot of our training programs that people often resonate really strongly with. Um, we call it the fatigue spectrum, and it really progresses the um, journey, if you like, of someone from fully rested on the left all the way through to highly fatigued on the right. And these are pretty predictable and sequential experiences that, that we can all have individually. Um, they're often things we can observe in other people, uh, in our workplace or in our families or uh, in, in other contexts. And we can see that you know one of the first things that indicates fatigue is that our mood drops away. You know, we tend to feel a little bit flat mentally and, and we tend to talk um, yeah, perhaps more negatively or in a flat way. Um, broadly speaking, our communication then drops away and that includes the, the quality of our communication, the clarity of our communication, but also the volume of what we say and how we articulate that. Uh, as we progress further along, the speed of what we do slows down. Um, sometimes we're aware that we're fatigued and we slow ourselves down so that the quality of our work remains high. And more often than not, our brain eventually will just slow us down, even if we're not consciously aware of it. Um, even with our best efforts and a lot of motivation, uh, eventually our accuracy will fall away and we'll have errors. Uh, and then, you know, finally we find that a lot of the physical capacities will start becoming impaired as well. But it's important to know that, that physical strength and physical capacity uh, at least in people that are trained for a particular job or task, is really a pretty resilient capacity that we as humans have. Um, there's been a lot of work done in physically demanding environments, both military and civilian environments, to show that physical strength and physical capability is, as I said, a very resilient um, aspect of fatigue. Even people who are very sleep deprived, for example, can often do physical tasks for quite, quite a substantial amount of time before we get to this final stage of, of microsleeps. And microsleeps are really just those very short, brief 
sleep that we can have. They can happen with our eyes open. They can happen with our eyes closed. And really, they're an, an involuntary sleep for a short period of time. Um, they're often accompanied with, you know, very slow blinks or eye closure, as I said. You know, the head might nod and, and fall down unintentionally. Um, and really, they're the very, very late signals relating to fatigue. Um, and usually when people talk about fatigue management, they're talking about trying to stop people or stop workers or protect workers from having those fall asleep events. Um, it's often, you know, very commonly discussed or characterised in drivers, uh, you know, lorry drivers, um, truck drivers, because obviously the consequences of error if you're driving a vehicle can be very significant very quickly. And so people talk about microsleeps in driving and, and management of fatigue as being a management of, of people falling asleep. But actually, in, in many work roles, a lot of these capacities further down the spectrum, towards the green end of the spectrum, are actually really, really critical. And so fatigue management in the best sense actually relates to having people be much more alert and mentally engaged so that you know, the speed of what they do, the efficiency of what they do, the productivity of what they do is higher. You know, the level of errors is lower. And even in many roles, to have improved communication. So the quality of handovers from the night shift to the day shift or vice versa allows for good quality communication. Um, if you're involving a colleague or a supervisor in a discussion to talk about a, a complex task, a, a maintenance task perhaps, the details of that discussion can actually be very important. So we need to be able to have good quality communication. So I really want to invite you to, to think about fatigue management as not stopping people or managing people falling asleep, but, but really, ideally, trying to keep people as close to, you know, really alert and mentally engaged as possible. Um, and, you know, quite honestly, quite frankly, you're, you're all going to understand this, you know, as humans, we just know that when we're awake and when we're alert, you know, life is just more enjoyable. Life's easier, it's more enjoyable. And that's true whether we're at work or not at work. So, you know, in my, in my mind, that, that really is the, the focus and the ideal of what we're trying to, to work on here. Um, I had a couple of other notes down here. They're things I've already mentioned before, but really just to say that most businesses uh, particularly talk about falling asleep as, as fatigue, but, but really there's a lot of other aspects to this. Um, and we can certainly envisage fairly easily that if people were more mentally alert and engaged, we can see that you know, error rates and efficiency and even morale would generally be higher. Okay, so we know that... Oops, I can see the slide has moved a little bit, but I'll, I'll work through that. Um, we can see that fatigue really does affect all of us um, in our workplaces and in our you know, non-work time. Um, we've talked about some of those factors and we're going to talk about that more in a moment. Um, but I also just wanted to particularly point out in, in the work context, specific groups whose roles especially make them prone to fatigue. Um, we've already mentioned workers in 24-hour settings uh, and of course that's obvious because as I said we're not programmed to be alert and engaged you know, 24 hours or around the clock. Um, we've also talked about this workload factor where those in boring jobs who can be very underloaded and get fatigued, um, as well as those people in very high tempo jobs who can get, you know, overloaded or, you know, over, overwhelmed sometimes um, are also prone to this. Um, we also find in certain remote work environments we have these drive-in, drive-out or dido workers or fly-in, fly-out, FIFO workers or even just people that commute a long distance each day or each week. When we add on the commuting and the travel, the long work hours, um, fatigue can certainly be, be much higher. Um, and then of course these on-call or call-out workers who are getting sleep disrupted or, or other activities disrupted to then go and do work without necessarily having been warned when it was going to happen, um, you know, that can certainly make people prone to fatigue as well, particularly if calls are coming in when I would normally be asleep or plan to be asleep. Um, and for those of you, or those of us, I should say, with children, um, you'll, you'll fully appreciate this as well because clearly the warnings don't come 
uh, we don't get warned when we're going to need to get up all the time. And so certainly parents, um, and especially parents who also then have to work full time, are also prone to fatigue at times. Okay, so I also just really wanted to acknowledge that, that even though we generally manage fatigue in the workplace at a, at a system and a workforce level or a group level, the actual experience of fatigue is very personal. So I'm not going to talk a great deal about this, but I really just wanted to acknowledge for all of us as individuals uh, to really uh, ensure that we uh, consider this and, and, and cover this. So, you know, we know that things like stress can influence sleep, for example. Um, we certainly know that, you know, sleep is, is interrelated with fatigue because often if, you know, I'm stressed or I'm otherwise not getting a lot of sleep, then that can certainly impact on my fatigue because obviously I'm, I have a sleep debt or I have a deficit of, of the ability to actually get the recovery I need uh, or even get the preparation I need for the, for the next day or the next week. So we know that there's, a, there's this cluster of interacting factors or variables, um, but it appears in our lives very differently. So if I have children versus if I don't have children, if I live very close to work versus a long way away from work, if I have a lot of worries or concerns of, at a particular point in time about a, a sick parent or a sick child or financial difficulties, you know, all of those things impact on my ability to get distracted, um, my stress level, which as I said can impact on sleep and then fatigue and performance. And Yeah, I think it's really just important to acknowledge that. We can't necessarily manage fatigue at an individual level in, in a big work group, um, but it's important to acknowledge. And it's also just important to acknowledge for ourselves as individuals to, to really be compassionate with ourselves and, and patient with ourselves sometimes because you know, we're not able to be fully functional you know, 100% of the time and we just really need to acknowledge that and be realistic about that. Okay, so just to, to connect to a bit of a personal story for a moment, um, uh, I was born in 1974 and there was a period of time in, in my life um, uh, before I was a teenager and just as I was becoming a teenager where there were some really major global catastrophic events. And I'm not, I'm not saying that I was necessarily aware of the fatigue factor of this all at the time, um, but I remember you know, waking up in the mornings and, and learning at school about you know, these really massive catastrophes that were global is global catastrophes really um, you know and the three examples I've given here are you know the Chernobyl nuclear reactor meltdown in 1986 um, the Exxon Valdez oil tanker grounding um, in Prince William Sound in 1989 uh, and the Challenger space shuttle explosion in 1986 and those of you in this field and, and probably even for many of you uh, who are joining us um, from more of a public sense rather than a, a scientific sense you'll probably already be aware that, that sleep and sleep deprivation and fatigue, you know, formally are acknowledged as playing big factors in, in these events and many others. So uh, I'm not going to necessarily talk about it, these catastrophic events, but it's really just to, again, acknowledge that the, the ultimate consequences of, of fatigue can certainly be pretty extreme. Um, on a day-to-day -day basis in our own lives, it tends to be smaller impacts on our communication and our relationships and the quality of our work and certainly in the workplace it, it, it impacts on safety and efficiency and productivity and morale as well as we've already said. Okay so I'm also just going to give this very very brief historical reference to research in the fatigue area just to acknowledge the work that's been done um, and I'll, I'll point you just to the bottom of the, the slide to acknowledge a, a a chapter that I did in a book, a book for the US Department of Transport a, a few years ago now. There's a lot of information in there. If you'd like a copy, just please email me and let me know. A lot of information in there about the more historical definition of key terms in this field of shift work and fatigue management, uh, and also a lot of the original studies as well. But today I just really want to acknowledge that scientific studies about work-related fatigue started back in the late 1800s in, in Europe, and there was a a cluster of activity, particularly through Britain and Germany and Belgium, um, from about 1893. Um, there was a very significant fatigue laboratory opened up in the US in Harvard 
1927. And that group really was focused on things that are still very, very relevant to us today. Things like the impact of work hours, you know, duration of shifts, times of day, things like that. Um, work environments, you know, does it matter if the work environment is very hot or cold or humid? Um, you know, how big a factor does sleep play in all of this? Um, how big a factor does nutrition play? And at, at that time, they were focused very much on salt balance and mineral balance. Um, there'd been a lot of lessons learnt in the First World War, for example, around you know, basic salt need, you know, which ultimately is things like yeah, sodium, potassium, magnesium, you know, those sorts of things, and, and also just general hydration. Um, there was even clarity back then, you know, in some cases, you know, coming on nearly 100 years ago, that things like productivity and absenteeism and equipment damage could be really impacted by sleep and fatigue. And really, as I said, not a lot has changed in, in some sense because the, the physiology and psychology of sleep deprivation and fatigue really hasn't changed because humans really, in many ways, haven't evolved. Um, so I just really want to acknowledge that historical link. Um, so now I just really wanted to focus a bit on, you know, these primary risk factor clusters. Um, as I've already acknowledged, these key elements interact a lot, even at the, the personal and individual level. But once we start getting into workplaces and we're dealing with groups of people, sometimes very large groups of people, um, there, there's a lot of other layers and, and variables that start coming into play. Um, a lot of the clients and, and workforces that my team and I deal with can range from, from very small groups. They might be 20 or 30 people in a control room environment or you know, in a small trucking company, um, all the way through to really huge workforces where there might be literally up to 10,000 people on a site in a, in a very large mining operation uh, or a very large oil and gas operation, for example, in a construction phase, perhaps. So there's a very big range of scales, and obviously I'm needing to simplify this to some degree. Um, but you can see in the centre of that screen, you know, there's a big factor on workload. Um, and we've spoken about the fact that the underload can be a major issue because people do get t tend to get bored and be prone to perhaps fall asleep because there's not much going on. Um, but also this overload factor where there's high tempo environments, lots of time pressures, lots of complexity and things like that. Um, but around that, we've, we've got all these other factors. So up in the top right, um, we've got staffing levels. Um, probably nothing can really fix the fatigue issue if staffing levels, levels are inadequate for the work that needs to be done. Um, if you've got too few people or too few people with the right skills to actually do the the work that needs to be done to fulfil the demands that need to be fulfilled, then really fatigue is a, is a very natural and major consequence of that. But, but no good roster or work pattern is going to solve the issue of not having enough people or not having enough skills. Um, you know, that, the work patterns that people work, you know, if people are, are being put on to shifts to work 24 hours at a time when there's a lot of demands required and no opportunity to sleep, well, clearly fatigue is going to build up very quickly. Um, we're not going to talk specifically about lots of aspects of work patterns, but there's certainly lots of research and, and practical guides around in terms of the key factors that can contribute to uh, good rostering or good scheduling um, or those kinds of rosters and schedules that can impact on fatigue. And then through the rest of this slide, there's just a range of other interrelated factors. So things like breaks and the timing of those breaks and the frequency of those breaks, both at work, within the workplace, but also between shifts or within the pattern of work. Um, we've also got this, you know, staff selection and training. You know, if people have good experience but they're not actually trained up in the specific requirements of a particular job or a particular role, then that's really going to throw their workload to a higher level and make their resilience and their ability to sustain high tempo, um, it's going to make it much more difficult. Um, you know, also these, you know, monitoring and managing layers because 
you know, as I've said, all of us are prone to, to be fatigued at certain times of a 24-hour day or, or after certain patterns of work. Um, and sometimes it's important that, that a system or a technology or a supervisor is actually monitoring us or monitoring the data that comes from our work and, and what we do. Um, and as I've already acknowledged, you know, there is a big link as well with stress because um, stress can impact on sleep, which in turn can impact on health and performance and, and fatigue. Um, so really they're the major uh, risk factors. Um, there's a lot of levels that sit below these key risk factors and a lot of elements that even sit within each of these risk factors. Um, and I'm always happy to provide more detail. So again, please feel free to email me or send me a message if you'd like more information about this. But um, given we also have people from the general public on this presentation, this is about the depth that I wanted to cover those, those primary risk factors. So uh, I'm now going to talk fairly briefly over the next three slides to just talk about some of the fatigue risk management things that we would really focus on in the workplace. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about this in, in this session because you're able to download the slides and so I really wanted these next few slides mainly to be available for you as a resource after the presentation. So if I go a little bit quickly on this, um, please know that you've got the slides and you can reference them after the, the presentation. But um, if we're starting out to, to develop or implement a fatigue risk management program in a workplace, you know, these are the four things that we really need to have as fundamentals. You know, these are really the, the foundation or the bedrock that everything else would be built on in the future. You know, we need to have visible leadership. Um, leadership at the very top of the organisation, leadership at the, the top of the site, site management, but also leadership and understanding within the workforce. Um, as I've already said, we need sufficient personnel to actually cover the operational requirements, which includes mandatory training, you know, mandatory annual leave and staff turnover and things like that, not just the work demand itself. Uh, we need to raise awareness through communication and training. Could be you know, relatively high level induction type information at the beginning of the journey and get more detailed as time goes on. Um, and we also need a reporting system um, and a reporting system that is aligned with just culture principles that really over time allows people to know that it is safe to talk about fatigue. You know, it is safe to you know, really discuss as peers and discuss with managers about the fact that fatigue can impact on the quality of the work or the safety of the work um, or the productivity of the whole work team. Um, and having that conversation and starting that conversation is, is really important. And a reporting system is a, is a key part of that. Uh, once we move into a more of an intermediate level, uh, we really start getting to this point where we need to formalise the fact that managing fatigue uh, is really a shared responsibility. Uh, it, it's impossible to manage fatigue in a workplace if, if it's seen as something that the, the management or the, the company or the employer has to do. Um, if workers see that it's all about the roster or all about the work environment and they don't take on responsibilities to manage their, themselves, then really fatigue can't be managed. Um, similarly though, it, it's also the case that if the workforce is really focusing on managing fatigue and, and helping each other to manage fatigue. And, and the management team are really seeing it as something that the, all the workers have to manage. And it's not something that, that the workplace or the roster influences. Well, that's obviously incorrect as well. And so we really need to get to this point where we do see fatigue management as a shared responsibility. And at the intermediate stage of fatigue risk management, that becomes a really big focus uh, and a really core part of the, the responsibilities that are both informal in discussion but also formalised in policies and procedures. Um, we'd also generally start using biomathematical models to actually predict fatigue in scheduled and actual work hours. Um, I also just want to acknowledge here that the on-call and standby are still not particularly well addressed by models um, because biomathematical models will generally predict when people are going to sleep. Um, but of course, in an on-call in environment, you might actually be getting an opportunity to sleep at a time you might also get called upon to do work. 
And so, you know, the models obviously can't predict when those calls come in uh, unless it's a very um, customised model and the data sitting below the model is actually really accurate and helps with the prediction. Um, we'd also start looking at routine analysis of other data, not just hours of work data, but they're really starting to see from a data science and data analytics point of view, you know, whether there are statistical relationships between things like hours of work or the scores out of the biomathematical model, um, safety incidents at different levels of severity, um, staff sick leave and the costs of those, uh, workload metrics if you have them uh, and things like that. You know, we often find very clear and sometimes actually very simple patterns in this data. Um, but in most organisations we find that um, safety and risk data is often looked at quite separately to you know, human resource and cost data like sick leave or staff turnover, which is looked at you know, very differently again to you know, other information around production or productivity uh, operational metrics. And actually, you know, in 2018, we've got a lot of you know, really quite cost-effective ways that we can statistically look at all of this data at the same time. We don't actually have to look at it in the silos or the columns that we have historically. And then when we jump more into the advanced stage, and, and I'll talk very little about this um, today, but you know, we really want to start focusing on proactive management of the risks that relate to fatigue. So this could be looking at seasonal effects over the coming months. It could be looking at staff turnover expectations in the, in the coming year or two. Uh, it could be looking at um, patterns in uh, the actual change to the work that we're doing and things that might increase or perhaps reduce the demands on the workforce and, and therefore affect fatigue. But we really want to be looking further over the horizon and not just dealing with the day-to-day -day in an advanced system. Uh, we also want to look at actually providing support to parts of the workforce that may have an undiagnosed or undermanaged sleep disorder. Um, now, generally speaking, in a workplace, particularly a heavy or industrial workplace, there might be perhaps 15 or even 20% of the workforce that do have a clinically definable sleep disorder, such as obstructive sleep apnea or um, restless leg syndrome or insomnia. Um, not necessarily all of those people are going to have clinical symptoms that are really needing to be managed from an operational safety point of view, but Certainly, probably one in 10 people would have a, a sleep disorder that's significant enough that really warrants some sort of treatment or support. And although one in 10 people might not sound like a lot, the actual facts are, and this has certainly been backed up by um, crash risk data from insurance companies uh, and accident and incident data from, from sophisticated companies, you know, that, that 1 in 10 or 10% of people might actually be carrying 30 or 40 or, or perhaps even more uh, in terms of the percentage of the people who um, are, have carry the risk for your operation. So 10% of your people might actually be carrying 20 or 30 or 40% of your risk. So it really is in an advanced system worth managing that small percentage of people and getting them supported to get their sleep disorders better managed. Um, and in an advanced system, we'd also look at, at IT integration and actually really starting to streamline some of these more technology-focused um, solutions, like the biomathematical modelling I spoke about, uh, like rostering systems, and actually doing some of that data analytics and, and data science more, more automatic um, than we might be able to do it as a first step. Okay, so um, I also just wanted to... Uh, point out that there's a, a really good resource that I find a lot of value in. It's kind of come out of a research group in Europe. Um, there's a website link there that you can um, go to. Um, it may appear that there's a typo uh, or a spelling mistake in this link. There's actually not. Um, me management uh, is, is incorrectly spelt, but actually if you go to that um, web link, you'll get this um, picture that I've got up on the screen now. Um, I'm not going to talk about it a lot 
right today, but again, it's just a resource for you or a reference for you after the call to actually look at 15 key elements that are relevant at different stages of the um, uh, sort of safety barrier approach um, to fatigue management. So I hope, hope that's a useful reference for some of you. Now, if you'd like to read more science, there's certainly good search engines that you can go to to actually get a lot more information. Uh, and again, you can do that after the call, but I just wanted to give you these references today. Okay. Um, there's also a couple of other slides here. Um, for those of you who are researchers and practitioners, I just wanted to give you a, a couple of slides of links uh, and, and papers that you can get that can be very helpful. Uh, and if you'd like, you can always contact me to be able to, to connect you with some of these articles as well if you have any trouble tracking them down. Okay, so I'm just going to wrap up over the next sort of five or six minutes. And before I did, I also just wanted to give some very brief examples. And, and again, I can uh, happily answer questions about these, but also provide more information about these after the webinar if you get in touch with me. Um, but these are just some of the more practical and, and effective tools that we've been involved in, in developing or using um, over the years. Um, the first one on the left is a, is a software tool that we've been involved in developing uh, with the Zurich uh, Insurance Company uh, and also another Australian company called uh, Interdynamics. And it's really just a, a, a key 24-question uh, risk assessment tool to look at the fatigue-related risk exposures and fatigue-related risk exposures, uh, sorry, fatigue-related risk controls uh, in a work setting. Um, and that's something we use regularly and is a very quick and uh, valuable tool that we use. Um, on the right, you can see that there's a set of six questions, uh, which is part of a, a one-minute fatigue self-assessment tool that we've developed uh, in conjunction with some of our clients. Uh, we currently have that available as a as a, a paper-based system and are developing it as an app-based system at the moment. Um, that's something that will be, be available fairly soon. Um, I've also spoken about the, the biomathematical models that can be used. This is just a, a screenshot of some of the biomathematical model metrics that, that come out of one of the biomathematical models called FADE. Um, moving on to the next slide. Um, there's also tools that we use more in our research studies in, in workplaces or our operational um, operational research studies that we do for our clients. Uh, on the, the far right, uh, you'll see a small like wrist-worn device, almost like a, a wristwatch. And uh, that's a device called an ActiWatch or an ActiGraph that we use quite regularly, actually. Um, we collect actually thousands of days and nights of data per year from workers in workplaces with these devices. Um, and we can objectively track sleep um, when people are at work, when people are at home between shifts. We use that quite a lot. Um, and on the left, uh, it's just a, a really quick diagram of, of a reaction time test that we use uh, called a, a psychomotor vigilance task test or PVT test. And again, we use these on iPads um, quite regularly uh, in workplace studies that we do to really just get a, a measure of uh, cognitive performance or mental performance when we're looking at performance in workplaces. Uh, I think that's it for the, on a couple more practical examples. So we also use you know, relatively simple things like brief five-minute email surveys to, to the workforce. Uh, if we want to do something more in-depth, we might do semi-structured interviews with key stakeholders and key workers in the workplace or even over the phone. Um, and obviously also you know, fairly simple things like online and classroom training on fatigue management. I mean, these are all just high-level examples of, of practical tools uh, for those of you that are actually interested in the, the management of fatigue uh, in, in the workplace setting. So really just to, to wrap things up before we get to the questions, I just really wanted to acknowledge that you know, fatigue is, is unavoidable where we've got shift work or on-call or 24-hour environment. Um, but as I said, it can also be seen as a, 
as a positive thing because it's often a protective mechanism that keeps us more safe and actually keeps us more productive. Um, fatigue can be managed successfully at the individual level, at the team level, you know, and really at that system or organisational level. Um, there are certainly many cost-effective tools and approaches that are available and guidance and support is available from within your own industry uh, as well as from agencies and governments uh, and other organisations like consultancy firms. Um, and just as a final point on this, I just want to say that really solutions should be respectful to us as humans. Um, we're, we're programmed to be very capable and we've got some great strengths and, and capabilities, but we're also not machines, thankfully. Um, and, and we should acknowledge those human limitations in these 24-hour work environments uh, and 24-hour work context settings. And if you're developing a fatigue management system for your workplace, I just really encourage you to start small. Um, we often find that, that very enthusiastic people want to try and take on, take on more than they can really handle as an organisation too quickly. So we really encourage you to start small and, and achieve some success in the basics before you really add the complexity because complexity can be a distraction and, and can really undermine getting the basics working. Um, changing behaviour about anything takes time, so treat fatigue management as an evolution that works over years, not a revolution. And also just really at an individual level, I encourage all of us to, to be role models and advocates in, in our workplaces, in our families and, and in our communities. You know, if I'm feeling well rested, if I'm alert and engaged, you know, people kind of want to know why. And that gives me the opportunity to talk about sleep and talk about the balance of exercise and work and sleep and family. Um, and so I really just encourage all of us, um, given that you're interested in this topic, to, to be those role models and advocates in, in your own, own environment. So just to keep us on time, uh, I'm going to wrap up there. And uh, I don't, don't know if we've got anyone who's going to uh, speak from NIOSH just to close this out or whether I'll do that. But I just firstly wanted to say thank you very much again for the invitation to pre presenting. And again, thanks for all of you that have joined us from, from every part of the globe uh, at different times of the day and night. And uh, I'm really grateful for your interest uh, and I'm really grateful for your uh, participation. And I'll sign off there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher, for a very interesting presentation and for engaging in a great Q&A session. I'd also like to thank um, all of our participants for joining us. Um, and I'd like to remind everyone that the webinar and presentation slides will be available on our NIOSH Work Schedules website, along with other archived presentations in this Working Hours Sleep and Fatigue webinar series. And again, if you would like a copy of the unedited transcript, please email Total Worker Health. Thank you all again, and we look forward to your participation in our next webinar.